justice for all. It's my honor to introduce three of our teachers who are being honored by Newman University on May 13th for outstanding graduate, uh, graduate students. So I would like to introduce Lisa Cady. She is being recognized as ESOL Curriculum and Instruction. Julissa Flores, she's an interventionist at A. Hubert. She's being recognized for Building Leadership. And Chrissy Marshall, a fifth grade teacher at Edith Sharman, I'm sorry, Abe, Abe Hubert. She's being recognized for a reading specialist. And not very many Newman students are being recognized for this honor, so this really is a true honor. And according to Dr. Gina Marks, I think her exact words were, Garden City really mopped up this year. So, and I forgot to introduce uh, Lisa as uh, literacy coach at Edith Sharman and George Matthews. So we're very proud of the things that they're doing. And very proud to have them in Garden City DSV 457. So, congratulations.
Okay, sorry about that. Um, Dr. Carlin asked me to come and visit with you all about kindergarten readiness. Um, that is one of the Kansas State Board of Education's five outcomes. Uh, I think you guys have talked about a couple of them already, and so he asked, he asked us to come and speak a little bit about kindergarten readiness. Um, Andrea Baker is our instructional <coughs> coach and interventionist at Garfield, and Monica Diaz is also the literacy coach at, at Victor and Ellis. And I asked these ladies to come along because they've been to a lot of meetings, and they've actually served on a couple of state committees that, um, that, that relate to this, and so they're going to have more information if you have questions than I might have since they actually attended some of the meetings. Um, I'd like to begin with, um, if we could, just a little message from uh, Dr. Randy Watson, our Commissioner of Education on Kindergarten Readiness and what that looks like. Now I'd like to talk to you about kindergarten readiness. It's one of the most important outcomes that we have and listed actually as number one uh, in the state board outcomes for the next several years. As all of you in education know, the largest gap we have, academically, behaviorally, and emotionally, happens day one when kindergarten students walk in for the first day of kindergarten. That's our largest gap. We have students that walk in day one who are reading at a second or third grade level, who can count well beyond 100. They know all of their colors, can attend a class, can work well with others. And yet, sadly, we have young people that show up that do not know where they live, cannot spell their own name, cannot attend a task, do not know any of their ABCs, have trouble working with others. And that's a no fault of their own. But that's the gap that we see every day in Kansas schools. The State Board of Education <coughs> wants to change that. And they want to change that by focusing on kindergarten readiness as one of their outcomes. And so here's what we're going to be doing in the next several months. We have a great team here at KSD, a great team with the Children's Cabinet, uh, Department of Health and Environment, uh, Head Start. We have all kinds of agencies working together to ensure that we can have every child ready for kindergarten in the next several years. So what we're working on is a kindergarten readiness screener that we can give out to all school districts. And you can use that to screen and then send us the data so that we have accurate, comparable data across the state of where every community is currently with the number and percent of students that arrive ready for kindergarten. This is not a measure to exclude people from coming to kindergarten, young people. It is not a measure to measure uh, kindergarten teachers or to measure school districts. It's simply to inform us where should we deliver the resources in Kansas so that every child has the opportunity to come to school, not just academically, but emotionally and socially ready. The other thing I want to stress to everyone is as we look at kindergarten readiness, it's so, it's so important that we don't forget that it's not simply about moving academics to a younger level. There's no reason that we should be drilling facts into three-year-olds and four-year-olds. What we need to do is to move developmentally appropriate practices for students of age three and four and even earlier that can grow, use their imagination, use play, learn how to work well with others, and grow socially and emotionally with a little bit of academics so that they're prepared for the academic rigor that's going to happen once they enter formal school. This is a great opportunity for all of us in Kansas to work together to really reach for the board's outcome of having every child can <coughs> I know that you're excited about this opportunity too. This will be a great chance for all of us to work together, to really roll up our sleeves in every one of our communities and say, what can we do to make sure that our community uh, has children arriving in school who are fully ready and capable of entering kindergarten. Thanks for your time. I look forward to talking to you next month with another video chat. One of the things that I would say that um, has changed a little bit, Dr. Watson talked a lot in there about it, um, having a kindergarten screener to look at. <coughs> they're really moving away, and we're going to talk about that here in a couple more slides, but um, they're moving away from the term screener, because when you say screener, then that kind of has the connotation that we're trying to exclude students, and that's not at all what they want to do. 
do so they're not calling it a screener, they're referring to it as a snapshot. We want to get a snapshot of, of the student's abilities. And so we'll kind of talk about that more here in just a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, kindergarten readiness, just like Dr. Watson said, is not intended to deny access to, um, to kindergarten. It, is, it is, serves as a snapshot and not as a screener, like I said. Um, the purpose of that is used really to collect data. And they're going to start collecting data in the 2018-19 school year and really identify um, what needs we have and where those needs are um, as, a, as a state. Um, and the purpose for that data is, is to, um, to create some of that critical data-driven data decision-making um, so that leaders, um, both locally and, and statewide, can, can decide where those resources need to be. Um, families, teachers, and administrators will be able to plan um, more strategically for, for what those kiddos need um, based on what their, what their abilities are at the time that they, that they enter kindergarten. So this is um, KSDE's um, tentative snapshot um, timeline that they have at this point. This is what we know. Um, there has been a lot of discussion, and these two ladies have kind of been a part of that discussion as far as looking at what does that tool look like, what is that going to be. Um, they, have not, they have not decided on it formally, um, but I believe that more than likely it's going to be the ASQ, um, which is the Ages and Stages Questionnaire. We'll know that firmly here in the next month or two. Um, but the plan is, uh, right now they're sending out recommendations for proposals um, statewide. Once they once they get the contract settled and they decide exactly what that question or what that what that survey is going to look like, um, then then the materials will be ordered and they're going to be shipped to all the elementary schools statewide. And then training will begin. Um, they're going to do uh, in the fall. We'll have a phase one trainer of trainers for kindergarten teachers. And then they'll have a follow-up in the spring um, so that everybody, all the kindergarten teachers are aware of, of what that's going to look like. And then um, in 2018-19 school year, at the beginning of the school year, they'll, they'll implement that. And the plan is to then compile all that data at the state level and, and make some decisions from there on, on what that will look like. As to what they're thinking or what their plans are there, I don't, I don't know that yet. My hope is that that's going to involve increased funding for early childhood. But I, I don't know what that's going to look like. I think we'll have to wait and see what the data, the data says for us. So like I said, um, we're really trying to look at it and call it a snapshot versus, um, versus a test. And so the difference is a snapshot is it looks at your developmental milestones. It, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overview of, of, the, of the child and their skills. It's very brief to administer, and it's all observational. So it doesn't require the child to sit. They take any test. It doesn't require them to perform any skills. It's going to be something that the teacher can observe in the classroom, um, or the parents will be able to observe at home. Uh, and then, you know, a test would be um, your measuring specific skills that are required. Um, it's a lot more comprehensive. It can be very lengthy to to administer, and it's it's done individually. And so uh, that's that's the difference between the snapshot and the test. So one of the things that um, the, the state is saying when you look at kinder, kindergarten readiness, early childhood experiences really do set the term for, for um, long-term success in school, and it's really based on, on five components, or excuse me, four components. Community, <coughs> the educational environment, the family, and the child. And the kindergarten readiness snapshot tool can help those educators look at that student and make some of those data-driven data, data decisions and see where those resources need to be, need to be put. So along with that, they have identified some developmentally appropriate practices. Um, educators should intentionally design lessons that, um, and, and have their classroom layouts um, using the child's interests and their home life into consideration, um, as well as their physical, social, emotional, and their cognitive development. Um, looking at our kiddos when they come to us, you know, we see kids that come into us with skills that are anywhere from nine months to, to six years old. And, you know, we have to really look at that and, and take into consideration the, the home life, the, the social skills of that child, and, and all of those things when, you, when you're trying to teach them. Data is really important. Data should be collected through observations as they interact with their peers and their environment. I think socially, that's one of the biggest things that, um, in my opinion, is going to be the, the success for children in kindergarten. I think we really need to look at, you know, are they going to be, are they going to be able to work independently? We need to cultivate that independence. We need to cultivate that that, that concept of cooperation with others and things like that. So, um, 
um, looking at those age-appropriate milestones. Um, and then we want to set achievable goals for the kids, you know, um, realistic achievable goals for each student and, and take them where they are and, and move forward instead of just having one, one goal for every, every child. KSD has also identified uh, six core principles for early learning settings. Uh, they are to enhance the development and learning, um, implement evidence-based curriculums that include play, um, access children's development and learning, or excuse me, assess children's development and learning, promote reciprocal relationships with the families, create a caring community of learners, and plan and impl implement successful transitions. And so at Garfield, these are some of the things that we do to try to support some of those things. Um, enhancing development and learning. Um, as a staff, we really try hard to provide a lot of hands-on, um, real-world activities to our kids. Um, we have guest speakers that come to the building uh, that support the curriculum. So uh, we have a unit on uh, community, community helpers. And so every year, we invite the police department, uh, the fire department, the paramedics, and they come and, and kind of talk to the kiddos and, and so that they can make that connection from what they're learning in the classroom and, and with real people. Um, we, we take a lot of field trips to support that. Uh, the last few weeks, the curriculum has been talking about animals, uh, zoo animals, farm animals, um, animals at home. And so we've had field trips to the zoo, we've had field trips to wards to, to see the pets in the pet shop, and just to try to tie in some of those things. We've really, this year, uh, changed our approach as far as instruction, and, and uh, I spoke to you all earlier in the year about how we moved, um, we moved the classrooms around to set up and we call them pods and so we have three teachers teaching and so we've really tried to look at collaboration there and, and, and how to support the kiddos in that manner and uh, if we have, have kids that are in the early childhood classroom that would that would do better going over to the to the L classrooms for a little bit for centers or vice versa we, we really try to do that to try to meet the, the kiddos and, and give them those opportunities that they need. A lot of our students that might be on IEPs in the early childhood classrooms going into those L classrooms socially might be good for them to have the those models to role to to role model you know appropriate play and, and language and, and things like that and so we we tried really hard to, to do some of those things. Um, obviously, we do have a, an evidence based curriculum that we use, but but along with that, our teachers every day have have activities that they do that support the curriculum through play. Different activities that they do, um, not only to to support the curriculum but to develop that language because that's really where our kids are going to get their language is, is from that play. Um, as far as assessing the children's development, we uh, twice a year we do the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test at the beginning and the end of the year to see what progress we're making with vocabulary. Um, we use, it's called My Higgies or My Individual Growth Development Indicators and that measures math and literacy. And so we look at that for all of our students that are going on to kindergarten. We assess them three times a year, beginning, middle, and end of the school year. But then in addition to that, the teachers have created report cards and, and classroom assessments that are based on our state standards. And those really look at, at the whole child. It looks at not only math and literacy, but it looks at social and emotional. It looks at fine motor. It looks at gross motor. All of those things that Dr. Watson was talking about, we really try to, to focus in on and, and make sure that we're measuring that for our kiddos. <coughs> and then promoting reciprocal relationships. Um, that's something that, and Andrea can probably testify to this, I preach that to our staff a lot. I think. You know, I'm a firm believer in relationships, and I think relationships with our families is, is critical to everything that we do, and it's going to be critical to the success of our kids. And so um, we really try to, to make that a priority uh, through some of our parent nights. We'll have different activities with um, teaching our families different activities they can do at home to support that learning. Um, you know, we have our math literacy and health nights. Uh, we just had fun night on, on uh, Friday night, so that's an opportunity for our kids to get to see us in a different, a different setting. And then graduation, you know, I think it's important for us to celebrate the fact that they're going on to kindergarten and they're ready to go, and so um, that's always a big day for us on the last day of school. So if you have nothing to do, feel free to come over to Garfield. We'll have six different graduation ceremonies going on that day, so I'll be happy to send Dr. Tron the schedule, and you're welcome to come over. We'd love to have you. Um, creating a caring community of learners. Um, as I, Like I said, you know, we really try to focus not only on, on the academic piece for our kids, but social fo focusing on that social piece, too, and and like I said, we've created that report card that measures all of those skills for our kids so that we're able to communicate that with our parents. And then planning that implement, planning and implementing that transition onto kindergarten. Um, every single one of our kindergartners that go on to, or excuse me, all of our preschoolers that go on to kindergarten, we have a transition staffing um, where we meet with 
a staff member or the principal from the, the school that's going to have them for kindergarten and, and create that IEP so that we can put a plan in place that's going to help them be successful when they transition. But along with that, at the end of the year, um, Ms. Baker always puts a, a packet together of, of things that, that we want the parents to know, skills that, that they need when they go on to kindergarten, and, and along with those skills, activities that they can do um, at home to, to support that for them. Um, and they're all things that they have in the home, so it doesn't require them to go out and spend a lot of money to buy a lot of things, but it, it gives them the opportunity to, and she's got it on a schedule where you can do one activity a day for the, for the whole summer, and it's about a 10 or 15 minute activity, but it definitely helps get the kiddos prepared. So, do y'all have questions for us? There's a lot more to this, but um, I thought we'll break it up in chunks and as we go forward there's more information that we can bring as we, as we gather more information. We actually have um, tomorrow, um, the three of us and some other, some other staff members, Dr. Carlin's going with us, and I think Leanne, are you going? Um, but we're, it's the Kansas Early Learning Roadshow, and so the state's gonna be here to share some more information with us in the morning. Um, so we'll be being in service for part of the day for that. And so um, this is just kind of the beginning stages of it, but we're, I'm excited. I think this is really, really exciting for early childhood. How is this, the, or snapshot, I guess, how is it different from the assessments the teachers are already using? Or is it kind of similar to what you're doing? I'm, I'm going to let these guys speak to it in more detail, but my understanding of it is I think a lot of these actually are going to be, they're like surveys that we send home to the parents, okay. and they're going to fill out, and they're going to kind of tell us a lot a lot of that information. I mean, mm -hmm. um, And is it information the teachers get back that they'll be able to use? That's my understanding. You, or will you kind of collect that before you send it off? I think, that, to my understanding, that's the plan. Yes, we'll, we'll be able to, to collect that information locally before we send it off. Okay. Um, because, well, and I, I hope we do at least, because... You'll, you'll need it quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not something where you can wait till the next fall or something. Right. Like yeah. <laughs> I have just a quick question on, on how the community can help support this. And to me, logically, I think a pediatrician as, you know, because they, they understand the, the growth charts mm -hmm. and developmental charts and things like that. I'm wondering if there's something that we could present or partner with the local pediatricians. I think that's a great idea. I can tell you that I know our numbers have increased for like our child find screenings that we do every month. Those numbers have gone up substantially in the last couple of years because I think <coughs> the are, and I think we've been around long enough that we're starting to get recognized in the community and they're definitely referring more kiddos to us. But I think that would be a well, in the summer would be a great time to, you know, work with, you know, set a period of time to work with the two-year-olds and then another period of time with the three-year-olds and kind of work on with the families, not just the students-to-be, right. on, you know, how to interact with your child and how to facilitate learning and exploration, which is where learning starts at that age. But I think it would be great in our medical community. I might be a little bit biased, but I think they're open to um, opportunities to get sure. involved like that. I think that's, I, I like that. I think it would be great. I might just, um, I hope the board and the community see tonight that um, we're a little ahead of the game here. When, when Mr. Diamond shared the principles that the state is identifying and Childhood Center, and, and even before that, in, in some of our early childhood classrooms, um, I really think that we're um, uh, we're doing a great job with this. And, and I, I hear that from our elementary principals when they talk about how they can see a difference in the students who have been in our early childhood program um, prior to starting kindergarten and those who haven't had that opportunity. Um, I'm excited because uh, the state seems to be putting an emphasis on this and hopefully there are going to be some dollars to expand this because if you if you do a little simple math here we have a cohort of about 600 kindergartners a year it varies probably by 40 or 50 uh, but we also have two parochial schools that have kindergarten sections so so we believe we have somewhere between um, probably 580 and 650 kindergartners a year um, in the community well if you back that up to three-year-olds and four-year-olds, that's about 1,200 three-year-olds and four-year-olds in the community 
Can you max out, Mr. Diamond, at about? We're at 530 right now as of the enrollment that I got on the 1st of May. So so we uh, we definitely have a gap in the community where we could be serving more kids. Now, there are some private preschools, some church preschools, and those are great. Those certainly make a dent in that as well. But I don't think we're probably getting to all the kids who could benefit from that. So one example, uh, the board's action on this. Tonight, you approved the lease with uh, uh, Head Start for a classroom at uh, Garfield. And we're looking at you know, increasing our partnerships with other organizations to provide more opportunities. But I think it's important that we know we are very hopeful that there's going to be more funding coming from the state for more early childhood programming because we can certainly use it in this community. And we think that's what this data will ultimately bear out. And we have the expertise, I believe, to be able to ramp up and to make an impact in that when the dollars become available. So, Mr. Guyman and the teachers, thank you for all your work. I think we're doing the right things. And hopefully we can expand and, and, uh, and get even more kids in the future. And it's a perfect opportunity to plug our district for the fact that we um, support and enroll all day kindergarten, even though we're being paid for half a day. And that shows our support and your endeavors here. And we had, um, we also have some, and we were going to bring, Andrew was going to bring them, but with the snow day, we didn't get them, but the state's given us, um, like, kindergarten in Kansas books, too, and so we'll be sending those home with the parents this year as well. So there's some good information in there as well. Well, that's so. great, and I hope people are able to share them with their friends and neighbors who maybe don't have a child. years uh, our State Department of Education has identified a growing trend in Kansas uh, across our state with college students who are in need of completion of remedial coursework in the area of mathematics when they when they first start college uh, many students were leaving high school and uh, not qualifying for college algebra forcing them to take introductory courses such as basic or intermediate algebra uh, during the 1516 school year uh, we were invited along with many schools in the state to participate in an interagency uh, partnership with KSVE and our local community colleges. And they, they wanted us to uh, work together to implement a new course called Transition to College Algebra. The aim of the course is to expose college-bound students to the concepts necessary to test into or qualify for college algebra right away when they enter college. Uh, and then of course, not making them have to take remedial, uh, introductory, or basic, or intermediate algebra uh, when they get to the college of their choice. Uh, the course re requires training from the state and regular communication with our local faculty, uh, the community college, uh, the teacher. We've chosen to participate in this for this last year and to continue on with the training and, and all of the communication and implementation of the program is Donald Raymer, and I'll let him take it from here. Excuse me, thanks Mr. Norby. Um, like you said, this is the first year that the KSDE um, offered this pilot class of Transition College Algebra. Um, it was set out for um, schools um, that have, have a diverse population that needed help building the gap of 
bridging the gap between, you know, like I said, a lower level um, math placement to college output at the next level. Okay, so um, when Mr. Norbert came to me last, uh, last spring, um, I was excited for this opportunity just because it was my first year in the district and I kind of saw like the difference of the student levels in my classroom. So I thought this was a good opportunity to uh, um, try to help build that. So uh, some basic information on this pilot is 39 high schools are involved in this this year um, and 24 different community colleges are participating. Um, like I said, we're working with um, the one here in Garden City um, Community College. So um, another thing is uh, KSD wants to expand it next year, so uh, we have kind of a, uh, or agreed to do it again next year. Um, the one thing with it is, is that we don't have to go to all the trainings and 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 do all those type of things that I've already done this year. So um, they want to expand it to collect more data um, to see if it's really a class that is uh, worth the value that they are saying it is. Okay, a um, couple things this class is guided by. It is guided by the Kansas College and Career Readiness Standards and the community college outcome standard. So they kind of bridged, went in and looked at all the standards that you know, the college and career readiness holds and what the community colleges expect for their college outcome class, and they tried to mend them together and create the curriculum based off of that. And so um, part of my job was to help make sure the kids knew kind of where they were supposed to go with it as it went into their next um, phase of their career. Uh, like you mentioned, I worked with uh, Field Terps are at the college monthly, communicating back and forth of uh, how our class is going and how are they preparing to become, you know, possible members of their their uh, their school or other state institutions. Um, we can meet sometimes we meet um, on campus over the phone through email. Just um, it is mandatory for at least once a month. Uh, next thing to talk about is I've had to go to the multiple trainings in Wichita. I had to do three days last spring, three days throughout kind of the summer. Um, a couple of those were online, so I didn't have to travel. And then two days during the school year, so I had one in early fall, and then I have one on Wednesday um, to finish up the uh, kind of the program. Uh, the course material, materials that the students get to work with is they have all were given a workbook um, that was um, prepared by the, the Dana Center in Austin, Texas. And uh, when I first got that workbook, I was overwhelmed because all it is is real world application problems. There's no problems that just look like two plus two, anything that just comes out and tells you, here's the problem, solve it. It's all applied to something that ties into what teenagers kind of want to know about, okay? The other part is it also ties into the Agile Mind. Um, like our freshman academy, their Algebra One and Geometry use it as well. Um, but I, I also had the opportunity to use it um, I, I really love these kind of three parts of it. The lesson previews, they gave me an idea before the students came to class, could they handle this information? And um, if they did it properly, it gave me a good, good uh, um, information on how detailed I had to be on that day. Or could we speed through it and go to something that was more challenging for them? In Agile Mind, they also have interactive lessons. So once again, if the students would use it properly, um, they were able to, you know, like uh, drag and drops and animated graphs and, and that type of stuff. Um, and then ultimately their student assignments that um, as soon as they're finished, you know, the, the kids know the results as soon as they're done. So it's immediate feedback. And then lastly, their exams are designed by KSD, so I really had no control over them. Sometimes the students were, would kind of get mad at me, man, that one was really, really hard. Why'd you do that to us? I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't have any. They, they email it out to us about the time, you know, when it's due, you know. So um, that was something for me that was a challenge was kind of giving up control and accepting what KSD kind of wanted information in this pilot. So with all that, I have to document all their, all their results, and, um, and we submit that the end, here at the end of May to KSD um, for them to evaluate how we are compared to all 39 other districts. Uh, how we selected our students. Um, we have 42 students. We started with 40, or we pre-enrolled 49 or 50. I don't remember exactly, um, but we had, you know, seven or eight students not take it because when they found out that by just not taking the course doesn't get them into training or college algebra, they're like, no, this isn't for me then. So they kind of backed out the last moment. But um, we we went ahead and selected our kids based off the ACT scores that they've had or the Compass score. 
from 2015-2016 school year. Um, we had uh, ACT scores range from a 13 to a 21. Um, that's what we selected our students on. Most of the schools in the pilot, they only accepted kids in that had 19 to 21 on their ACT score. The compass scores range from a 12 to 40, um, which was in basic math. Most of the students actually tested into basic math at the college, um, and those were the ones we took. We also took the recommendations from our school counselors um, for kids that were, they knew for sure they were college bound, they had a goal to graduate college, and they were good students that one didn't have attendance problems, and two didn't have a lot of discipline problems, uh, just because it was going to kind of throw out the data for the state if they're not in school for those regions. So we went with those students, and, uh, and we, we accepted the challenge to try to get them to can where I, they needed. Can I inter interrupt there for a second? The, the state did set some parameters for us. They maxed out the enrollment per section at 20 students. So they had to be small sections, especially for the pilot. Uh, they paid for one classes, one section's worth of books and materials for there. We thought it would be a valuable program for more than that. So we expanded the numbers in there to offer two more sections of this for kids. And then we paid for the, for the workbooks and things for this second section because we thought it would be a good thing for our kids to be exposed to. So the, uh, in, in addition to the testing criteria to get into the course, there were some other criteria as far as the size of the section and, uh, and the materials and things. All right, so here are a couple, just some of my th thoughts on the class. Um, one, I was really excited for the opportunity like I already mentioned earlier. Um, but after I went to the first day of training last that fall, I was really, really worried uh, for the simple fact that it was all applications. And I knew that the kids we had enrolled, they, they scored between a 13 and a, really a 17. And, you know, if you've ever taken the ACT test, to score a 13, you have to be able to solve like 3x equals 9 and know that x equals 3. And so we had kids that really kind of struggled with that, that concept that wanted into this class. And, and um, you know, so... I was really worried after seeing what the curriculum was going to tell about detailed word problems, how you had to apply this to get to the, the solution, um, that they weren't going to be able to handle it. Um, I put on there, I was frustrated at the beginning of the year, because anytime you, you start something that nobody has, had, has any knowledge or experience with, and you're the only kind of one that has been to anything, you have to really be a problem solver. So um, trying to deal with technology um, through a place in Texas, um, when you had to call in the middle of the day when all the other schools are starting and nobody can answer you and they call you back at 10 o'clock at night or whatever, it was just it was a little frustrating because um, some of the kids couldn't log in even though they had their login. So first of the year was just a challenge. Um, but after that, once we got up and running from September to April, it's been probably one of the most enjoyable classes I've taught. Um, one is that it is truly a low stress for seniors in there if they just stay on top of things. Uh, because of the previews, they give you an idea of what to expect, and then in the workbooks, they give you, you know, we walk through things and make them apply concepts in, in small groups, class discussions, and then they get time to I mean, take